Hi, my name is Rob Scott from UC Today and welcome to another monthly edition of our Microsoft Teams news update. So just before I get started, I want to give a quick shout out to Ribbon Communications for sponsoring this month's news update. So today I'm joined by Tom Abuthnot, UC Solutions Architect, Microsoft Certified Master and MVP. Great to see you again, Tom. How's things? Yeah, good. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I've, uh, off this week, so it's a little bit more chilled out. But uh, yeah, nice to catch up. Yeah, well, good stuff. Well, I'm in quarantine, actually, this week. I, I, I was lucky enough to get a holiday, <laughs> uh, which I feel very fortunate. Uh, but I'm back in uh, quarantine because I've not really left the house. Apart from I'm allowed, to, if I if I go out the house with the dog, I'm actually allowed to take a bit of a stroll. So that's quite nice. Oh, is that the rule? If you can take the dog, you're fine. As long as you take yeah, the dog. Yeah, dog so I'm, I'm, the dogs are tired. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well you've got you've got a uh, you've got plenty of open space around you, so you're not lacking for uh, like alone walking space. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, well, it's uh, it's not too bad today. The sun is shining up in the north of England. How's it down there? Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, weather's been good actually. It's been uh, we've got some building work going on and stuff, so we've been home taking a week off, just uh, doing a few family things and chilling out. It's been nice. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate you taking time out to record this month's session, but uh, hopefully it's not going to be. Uh, a huge session today because it seems a little bit quiet on the Microsoft front. Has, has everyone at Microsoft taken a holiday? Yes. So Microsoft run a uh, mid-year uh, financial year. So often July and August are relatively quiet as everything changes and, and they get started and everybody takes leave around this time plus all the other world events. So yeah, it's been a little bit quieter than usual, but uh, still some interesting tidbits have dropped through in the news. Indeed, and I'm sure there's going to be some quite busy people at uh, Microsoft still because they just want to deal with PepsiCo to run uh, to roll out like 270,000 users on Microsoft Teams. I mean, it's just huge. Yeah, yeah, another another big win, a big brand. They love um, winning these big brands, and it's it's interesting how more and more multi hundred thousand new user orgs are committing to the whole of M365, which is a, a big strategic move and a big spend. So it's good to see people getting uh, potential value out of that. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Actually, it's a, it's just, it, it's, I suppose it's just demonstrating that enterprises at that level are all migrating to the cloud. So it's another uh, a nice accolade for Microsoft Teams. So um, let's look at the news for the month. So uh, we've got some great news. So so stay tuned. It's not a quiet month. There are things happen. So let's start. Let's start off with the, the on the SIP phone front, Tom, because there's uh, quite a few things been happening around this uh, supporting standard SIP phones. Tell us more. Yeah, this, I wouldn't have seen this coming necessarily. Uh, this is really big news. So Microsoft again to natively support standards-based SIP phones against Teams. So if you think about the the many many environments out there that have loads and loads of investment in Cisco phones or Avaya phones or any other phone, all those phones can run a standard SIP firmware. So they they can register against in Cisco's case against Call Manager or they can have a standard SIP and register against anything else. And Microsoft are now going to support that in their cloud. So you'll literally be able to take your Cisco handset, flash it to standard SIP, register it up to Teams and have it work as a Teams phone. So I imagine, I mean, I've, I've played with SIP phones and worked with SIP phones over the years. And in a very, I mean, in a very kind of standard way, they function just like an analog phone. So I'm taking it that I'm reading this like a, a move to support just standard SIP devices. So it could be a door phone, or it could be, uh, you know, a guest phone. Uh, what's your take? Yeah, it's interesting. The, the, the announcement is not super clear on supporting things like that. Logically, they should be supported as well because they're just SIP. So anything that SIP registers should work. But it's more about companies that have made heavy investments in IP phones that don't want to swap them out for relatively expensive Teams phones. So if you've got tens of thousands of Cisco phones, but you're strategically moving to M365, you don't want to spend $250, $300 a desk swapping a piece of plastic for a piece of plastic. That's the perception. Now, a Teams phone does a whole bunch of things a standard SIP phone doesn't. You know, you've got fancy calendar and click to join and, and all sorts of fancy features. But from an accountancy point of view, they're like, yeah, you pick it up, you talk, you hang up. So they don't want to spend that money. So this enables you to move to the cloud and to Teams and reuse that investment in those pieces of plastic on the desk, basically. Mm, interesting. It's almost like letting your users down gently, isn't it? It's kind of, well, now you've got a Cisco phone, but it's been a really basic SIP kind of you know, format. 
So yeah. yes, it's not going to do very much. Actually, there's probably more value on the screen. So well, we see this all the time, time as well. We see people spend lots of money on IP phones on Skype for Business and Teams, and they don't get used because people get the handset. They can't imagine using a headset before they get one. They're like, no, I've always used a phone. I want a phone. They get a phone and a headset. Then they use a headset, and then the phone gathers dust. So it's really hard up front to convince users. They don't need handset, um, but yeah, if you can reuse the handset you've got with with no additional cost, then you you solve that problem. And and I think you see competing cloud platforms that are able to register SIP phones. So I think Zoom can register SIP phones, for example. So they could go into a, an existing PBX account and say, look, reuse all your phones. Microsoft can do that too now. Mm, it's interesting, isn't it? So um, yeah, I mean, it makes good sense. But uh, it's, it's interesting that they've they've done, they've done that after. You know, all yeah. the work that's happened the, the, in the certified yep. world. The other reason why probably is that you have these phones called 3PIP, which registered to Skype for Business, like Poly VVXs, and they run a special firmware to register Skype for Business. And like many Skype customers have, have bought tens of thousands of those. Those can also run a standard SIP profile. So it's letting those customers have a long-term migration path for that investment as well. So there's a competitive angle sweeping up existing competitive accounts and they're supporting customers who have sunk money in the Skype journey, bought those three PIP phones, still have a longer life on them for, for Teams basically. Mm. Okay, so they've also done something else, though, haven't they, recently? They've lowered the price of the basic IP phone and USB phones. Why have they done that? Yes, yeah, so, so same type of thing. Like, like, like Microsoft are very knowledge worker focused, like make the best thing you can make. And on the IP phone front, that means having relatively expensive internals to do fancy things. So the base cost of a Teams phone is relatively expensive um, compared to like a SIP phone, which you can go way, way down in price. So competitively, Microsoft have looked at building cheaper, kind of more common area, more basic, smaller screen, basic function buttons, Teams phones. Um, they've also brought back what was a very old uh, kind of link Skype thing of having USB handsets, which is a essentially looks like an IP handset, but doesn't have the guts, doesn't have an Ethernet connection, just has a USB cable that goes into a PC. So the PC is doing most of the brains of it, but physically you have dial buttons, you have a screen, you have a handset. So again, that's been a like, if I can get one of those cheaply, I've already got a PC, but my users want the form factor. They don't want to wear a headset, they want to pick up. They could do that with a USB device. Well, and have you used one of those? Is it, is it really a, a you know feasible option on the desktop? <laughs> Yeah, like like in the old in the old days, I've tested them out. Like I would never use it because I'm a headset user, really. But there are some users who don't like the idea of of headsets, um, but have a a wired in permanent PC. So there's no reason why they couldn't use a USB device. But it's really a cost play. Like like if you can afford it and you want IP phones, you'd probably buy proper IP phones and have the PoE and the, the dedicated network connection and the dedicated hardware. Um, but there are just some use cases where they want the form factor, they are happy to run against the PC, then clearly there's enough of a demand that Microsoft have, have done some reference design stuff and said, look, vendors, we think there's a market here. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It must be a market. So um, let's move on to the next news item then. So this one's a little bit more technical on the session border controller front. Uh, Avaya have uh, joined the party, haven't they? So tell us more about that. Yeah, so this is so so last month, I think, or the month before we talked about Cisco uh, joining the party. And this is you have uh, physical or virtual session board controllers, kind of gateways that connect Microsoft's cloud to telco, to AT&T, BT, Pure IP, Level 3, whoever. These devices do that job. They connect the two worlds. And traditionally, you had people like Audio Code and, and Sonos, um, any node doing the, the that join and they would certify with microsoft but the the bigger competitive vendors like cisco and avaya have their own session board controllers so now those vendors are working with microsoft getting certified so that you can connect microsoft's teams cloud to their session board controller so what that means is if you've got a cisco telephony estate or an avaya telephony estate you've probably got one of these session border controllers already now you could start putting teams users on leverage that existing infrastructure again um, and say all my field sales are going to go team but i don't need to change anything about my supportability or my config or my kind of basic topology i just reconfigure the spc slightly to connect to teams they can carry on using 
same phone numbers, same same internal experience. That's a very open philosophy for Microsoft to do that again, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I almost don't understand it because you're le letting a, a third party vendor you know, connect into your world. So, uh... yeah, I mean, Microsoft have these ecosystem programs and they genuinely are open. Anybody can submit to certify basically. Um, and their, their philosophy is the more options and the more competitive it is, the better for Microsoft and the better for the customer. So it's more, why would Cisco and Avaya do it? And, and the answer is, well, they'd rather hold on to that piece of the pie than have the fight and lose to a competitive SBC. So at least if you're an Avaya customer and you've got tens of thousands of Avaya IP phones and some people want Teams, you can start moving them over gently. Whereas if you say, no, you've got to make a hard choice, pick new kit or stick with us, they might lose that battle and suddenly they've lost all the, the, the other core business as well. So it's about being more realistic about where you're playing, particularly with Cisco. They've got so many other things they want. They've got the routing, the switching, the servers. They've got a whole Wi-Fi, a whole bunch of stuff. They can afford to be more open. Avaya, I think, is a bit more interesting. They haven't got such a big portfolio, but clearly they're seeing customers say, look, we want to do some teams, and we'd rather do it with your kit than swap it out, basically. Yeah, well, as you say, legacy investments uh, or just investments full stop uh, can be huge, can't they, in the enterprise, and Avaya do play in that world. So. Um, I think it's really yeah, and it's, great. it's the operations model as well. The thing to remember is like there's the, the cost of the kit and cost of plugging it in. That's one thing. And that's going down with things like running them in AWS or Azure. So you can go spin up an USB-C in five minutes. But if your whole operating model and your support team and everything else know the kit they know, that cost of swap out can be more than the kit itself in some cases. Yeah. Well, I think it's great to see. So an, another vendor working you know, well within that Microsoft Teams ecosystem. So... Let's move it on to uh, Microsoft Teams rooms and Surface Hub working together with coordinated meetings. That was the title on your blog this month. Uh, yeah, it's catchy, August. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's a, a tongue twister. Tell us more about that kind of hookup between these two worlds. Yeah, so, so two Microsoft devices that do similar but not the same thing. So Microsoft Teams room is your audio video device for Teams meetings, but it also has touch, it also has whiteboard. And then Surface Hub is your collaboration board, but it also has a video camera and it also has mic and speakers, so it can join a Teams meeting. And, and they're very different use cases. MTR is primarily your conference meeting room system that happens to do some whiteboarding. And Surface Hub is primarily jump up to the board, do some interactive drawing work together, and it happens to join meetings. But the two didn't have any recognition of each other. So if you put them in the same space, and some customers have this, they'll have the, the Surface Hub as the whiteboard and the MTR as the meeting join. When they join the meeting on one, the other didn't know about it. So if they both joined, you get that classic, we have to mute one, we have to mute the other. The users have to understand how to have it join the meeting, but not with audio. What this feature does is say in config, you can say these two devices are in the same physical space. Whichever one hits join, join the same meeting and usually fire up the MTR for audio and video and fire up the Surface Hub for whiteboard and have it all ready to go without the user having to kind of choose, oh, this camera on, this camera off, that kind of thing. Great stuff. So there's a really good use case for that and, uh, you know, a practical you know, purpose to that, to that solution. So I really like that. Um, now, moving on to a slightly more technical one, uh, Microsoft Teams PSDN call logs uh, have been somewhat improved. Tell us more about that. Yeah, this is super, super techie, more for kind of ISVs in, in the Microsoft space. So previous to this announcement, the only way you could get your, your bill, your call records from Microsoft, was to log into a web portal and download an Excel file. So many, many big customers want to understand their telecom spend, their conference spend, their, ca their carrier spend. And they want to cross charge it to different countries or business units um, but you'd have to download an excel slice and dice it in some way so so modality would do it in sql and power bi for example um, but there was no api driven way to just grab that information and there are quite a few isvs on the market who will take call records from cisco avaya mitel whatever merge them all together into a giant database and cross charge even down to like the user or the business unit but they couldn't easily import the team's data so now in in preview there's an api where that vendor can just hook up grab the call records pull them to a database and slice and dice them basically 
Very nice. And and is that a licensed API uh, or not? Is that open? Oh, yeah, good question. Uh, no, so it's 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 cool record. So it's it's included. It's not one of the advanced comms APIs. But yeah, that is a question we have to ask ourselves these days. No, it's open to open to all users at the moment. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, well, I can see that that's going to be very useful and potentially opens it. You know, the the platform up for uh, cool login vendors as well to get involved uh, in Microsoft Teams. Definitely, yeah. I expect we'll see all the major vendors now have Teams as an option for the billing. Definitely. Good stuff. Well, um, moving on to one that's a little bit closer to my heart, um, because when you first told me about this, I got ever so excited that we could improve our video quality uh, when we were working with Microsoft Teams. Uh, so the NDI uh, solution or, or product, or I don't know what you call it, NDI for Microsoft Teams is rolling out, Tom, isn't it? Tell us more about that. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about this this previously. Um, this is kind of a, a, a broadcast technology coming from the kind of Skype TX type side of the, the Microsoft family. But it's the ability to join a Teams meeting and have the audio and the video piped out of the meeting to your local network or your local PC. So what that means is you can take the individual feed, so I can take the different people in the meeting, I can pump them in something like OBS, which is a kind of broadcast layout system. I can pump that into YouTube or Facebook Live or whatever else. And the idea is very much like you see on TV, you'll see you know proper layouts with uh, lower thirds and different people in different places or everybody lined up on a virtual bench, that kind of thing. You can do any of that layout stuff locally. So it gives you the option to use Teams for a a broadcast scenario and lay out the audio and video, record it locally, stream it to live platforms, however you want. Yeah, so it, it, that's very cool, isn't it? Because if you are live streaming or creating live events, uh, you're in media or podcasting or whatever, even at amateur level, it's po potentially solved a really big problem. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Although I, I'm not sure whether I can work it all out, or all that equipment, but um, certainly uh, uh, it's a really nice solution from my Microsoft coming through there. So, yeah, yeah. It, it plugs a definite gap. And again, competitive platforms have this type of technology. So Microsoft wants to be the de facto for that kind of recording scenario, definitely. Great stuff. So that's it on the news front. So not as much as last month or the month before. Uh, however, let's, let's just talk about uh, an event that's coming up that, um, Tom, you're involved in Teams Fest, 7th of October. Yeah, yeah. So another uh, really big online community event solely focused around Microsoft Teams. So this one is organized by uh, Chris Ford, Adam uh, Dillinger and uh, Vesu Napan, Chris Webb, who are four different MVPs around Europe that are organizing the event. And it's just an insane list. And these events keep getting bigger and bigger in terms of a number of sessions and speakers. I think What's interesting is there's quite a few Microsoft speakers on the roster as well. So it's nice to see Microsoft super engaged with these community events. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and I look down the list of speakers and sessions and there's lo loads on there. So it looks like it's going to be a really good one. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, uh, these events are really drawing in the numbers as well with this pandemic stuff going on and all the adoption. There's a lot of interest in how to get the most out of teams i think it's interesting you wouldn't normally see whole conferences around a single product but because teams reaches into power platform and automation reaches into genuine collaboration workflow reach into all the uc elements there's there's a lot to talk about and as we see every month there's always something changing always something new so that the hard thing really is just keeping up with all the content yeah, you're absolutely right. Just keeping up, I think, is the is the biggest challenge. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Tom, it's been great speaking to you today. Thanks for a, another fantastic news update. Uh, thanks to everyone for watching and tuning in. If you've enjoyed today's session, do give us a, a quick like or a share on social media. It's always appreciated. Uh, but we will be back again, won't we, Tom, uh, for another news update next month. Uh, but for now, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you.